traditional risk transfer in this simplest form is what you think of when you think of insurance. You pay me a set amount of premium, you transfer the risk of loss to the insurance company. If in fact you have a loss, the insurance company indemnifies you. Now the principle of indemnification is to not make you be any better off, but it is to make you whole. So the amount that you have lost gets replaced by the insurance. Currently, we write probably 85 to 90% of our business is in the traditional market. Uh, it's really with the onset of the ACA back in 2010, uh, where we started to see industry consolidation. And what that means is that in order to comply and uh, be most prosperous under the ACA, it was all about patient safety, continuity of care. And to be able to do that, health systems, hospitals, large physician groups have begun to consolidate. When you are an admitted carrier, you have to be approved to write business in the state. You also need to have the forms approved by the state. And you also have to have the rates that you're gonna charge approved by the state. In exchange for all that regulation, uh, your policyholders uh, know that you have access to the guarantee fund, which is basically a surplus fund in the event that a company who is admitted goes out of business, there's a pool of money there to pay the claims and the obligations so that the policyholders are not left in a lurch. We insure physicians uh, all across all 50 states through our different underwriting companies. In Massachusetts, we underwrite under Medical Professional Mutual Insurance Company. Uh, many of the other states along the eastern seaboard uh, and across the upper Midwest and Pacific Northwest, we underwrite as ProSelect Insurance Company. Uh, we underwrite as Coveris RRG in New York, and across the southeast, southwest, uh, south central part of the United States, we underwrite as uh, PPIC, Preferred Professional Insurance Company. So even though we have different underwriting companies, it's still all under the Coveris umbrella. With respect to traditional risk transfer, it's still individual and small physician groups. There are still individual small community hospitals who are out there. Um, there are a, a uh, a large number of different kinds of facilities, whether they are urgent care centers or surgery centers, uh, which have popped up uh, retail. Um, and when I say retail, I mean uh, locations such as Minute Clinic. I'm sure we've all been to a CVS. An underwriter has to look at so many different pieces of information and take it all into account and then make, um, and then make an educated decision. So you're looking at things like, where did they go to medical school? What kind of practice setting are they in? Have they had claims? If so, when were those claims? What was the nature of those claims? Is there a trend to those claims? What kind of limits do they have? Who do they practice with? So there's a variety of different things that you have to look at and take into account um, to, to make the appropriate subjective decision. So there are very good reasons why two accounts that may look very similar on the surface get charged or given different terms um, that are different. So when you get requests in, either from an insured, if we write them directly, or from an agent, if they're through an agent, um, the first question I ask is, is it a fair and reasonable request? And what I mean by that is, are we being asked to compromise either the exposure that we are covering, or are we being asked to compromise the price that we think we should get for that exposure? If, either the, if those answers are no, then I say go ahead and do it. Even if it is maybe outside of what your regulations or guidelines would say, uh, you simply document in the file, this is what I've done, this is why I did it, this was my rationale. Saying no is part of the job. Um, sometimes it's harder than others, but saying no is part of the job of an underwriter. But ultimately, what you want to do in that process is to say, um, did I look at everything? Because uh, you want to make sure that the answer that you're giving to the agent or the insured is well thought out, is well reasoned, has good rationale behind it, and has good data behind it. It's an ongoing balance as underwriters to try to make sure that we have the top line growth that every company is always looking for, uh, but still leading to bottom line results. Our current CEO, Greg Hansen, was at one time the vice president of underwriting. And at that time, I specifically recall him saying, this is maybe 10 or 15 years ago, that he would rather have a small, profitable book of business than a large, unprofitable book of business. Fast forward, now that he's CEO, amazingly, he would like a large, profitable book of business. So it's our job to try to deliver that for him, and we work with a variety of different departments to do that. By and large, we are driven by agents and brokers, so commercial insurance agents, retail agents, everyone from 
the small insurance agency that you would see on the corner of your town to the largest national brokers, whether it be Marsh, AJ Gallagher, Willis. So a majority of the business is driven through the agents and by the agents. And we have to understand they have clients and their client is, is the insured. And as such, we have to use the agent as the conduit. So we have to have a good relationship um, with the agent. We need to make sure that we explain our underwriting decisions, so that they understand the process that we're going through, why we're going through it, and why we make the decisions that we make. Medical professional liability is uh, a, a, a very strong relationship-oriented business. And the reason I say that is because it's not as if it's an auto claim where you know what the physical damage is or a property claim where you know what the physical damage is. Here you're defending reputations of our insureds, some reputations that were built over 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And even if you have a claim, just the idea of being named in a suit, even if we don't pay an indemnity on that claim, which in fact, we don't pay indemnities on 75 to 80% of our claims. Most claims close without an indemnity payment but it's still a traumatic experience for that insured. The fact that it's reputational makes it more personal and makes it much more relationship oriented. And that's why the agents and brokers that we deal with have strong relationships with these insureds. They may be building them for two to three years before you even see a submission in the door as an underwriter. So we have to understand the kind of effort and work and relationship building that has gone into just getting a submission in the door to us, much less us being able to underwrite it, make a good decision, and maybe win that business or to retain that business. We really have four or five different departments who are part of the servicing of the business. There is information that I can get from our claims or from our risk management uh, team that they can give us insights. They've been out with the insured, they've met with the insured. They can provide information that I wouldn't have just on the black and white of an application. That's very valuable to us. Uh, we can ha use our uh, business development team to provide market intelligence about who our competitors are, what they're doing, how they're operating in the marketplace, and how that could affect what we are going to or not do on particular accounts or book of businesses in certain jurisdictions or specialties. So it really is an ongoing team effort for the underwriters to be in constant communication with all the members of the team so that they can you know, make the best decision that they can with the best information that they have at the time. Thank you.